hereby call to order the Roseville City Council meeting for Monday, October 17th, 2022. Mr. City Manager, would you call the roll, please? Council Member Strawn? Present. With no microphone. Oh, we need to help. <laughs> Probably didn't get one hooked up for you, but uh, we'll get that straightened out before too long. And we do have a bit of a tone there. Start again. Council Member Strawn? Present. Council Member Groff? Here. Councilmember Wilmus? Present. Councilmember Atten? Mayor Rowe? Here. And Councilmember Atten indicated uh, ahead of the meeting that he would not be uh, able to be here this evening. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to make sure we can get a microphone for both our attorney and Councilmember Strawn. Um, probably uh, up until that point, uh, since it's kind of a directional microphone, you'll want to make sure it's pointed towards the person who's actually talking. To. With that, I um, would ask folks if you have a cell phone to be sure and silence it or otherwise uh, make sure it doesn't disrupt the meeting this evening. Uh, and if you're able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next on our agenda is approval of tonight's agenda. Um, just a quick check with staff, any changes no from changes. the staff perspective, all right. Uh, any uh, changes from the perspective of council members this evening, uh, council member Strong? Mayor, I'd like to remove um, item 10C from the consent to discuss placement all right. of the All right. Okay, let's see. Any other changes from the council perspective on the agenda this evening? No. All right. And I'll just check, uh, is there anyone from the public who is here to speak on an item in section 10 of tonight's agenda, which is the consent agenda, items A through C. Uh, these items would normally be taken up as a uh, single motion, uh, although as we've noted, we're taking C out of the picture there, uh, but otherwise would be considered as a single motion with limited opportunity for input and discussion. Is there anyone here this evening for an item in section 10 of tonight's agenda. Okay. Seeing none then, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the change to items 10C being considered separate from the consent? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Wilmes, second by Councilmember Strawn. Uh, any discussion on that motion to approve the agenda as amended? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes unanimously four to zero. We have our agenda for this evening. Uh, next on the agenda would be uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to items that are not on tonight's agenda, but may be related to city business or of interest to people in the city. Is there anyone here to speak tonight on items not on tonight's agenda? All right, seeing no one and we don't have any remote participants. Let me verify that. We do not. We do not. All right. With that, then we'll move on uh, to our rest of our agenda this evening. And our first item uh, then would be in uh, section six, items removed from the consent agenda. That would be item 10C. Uh, and I'll turn it over to City Manager Trudge and I presume for a introduction of this item related to sign permits for the community visioning hello lampposts. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this item would approve the placement of signs on city property as part, a part of the community visioning process. The Hello Lamppost site, if you recall, that is a sign with a QR code where people can provide input uh, into the community visioning. Uh, as we typically ask for permission for placement of uh, city signs um, at the start of the year, and obviously could not anticipate that would come in at this point, uh, and providing a list of where we'll have that, uh, mostly in parks and some of our buildings. I would note that uh, this is not the only location for these signs. They'll be throughout the city. We've been in contact with the school district, various businesses, and uh, working through those uh, approvals in private property. But tonight, we need specifically the council to take action on the city locations um, for the signs. So we're asking for your approval on that, and we'll get them up as soon as possible. All right, thank you, Mr. Trudgeon. Uh, questions, uh, and I know Council Member Strong, you had asked for this to be removed. Yes, thank you. I was mostly just making sure that those were not the only site locations, noting that there's the absence of Southwest and Southeast Roseville rep representation of the listed options. Uh, correct. Uh, maybe I can have uh, Assistant City Manager Rebecca also come up. She's been working specifically on the placement. I know there's many locations, but she can probably give us a quick overview of where those would be. Great. Ms. Olson, welcome. 
Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Member Strawn. We currently have uh, roughly 45 or so different locations and we're in the process of doing an overlay of our census uh, data based on languages and population with where we're locating the signs and we're anticipating having them throughout the city in various locations. Um, we're also in the process of making sure that the languages on those signs are um, appropriate for the locations that they're in. So we do have some um, in various places. We're in the process of also getting permissions as well. So um, hopefully in the next week, you'll start seeing the signs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for staff from council members? All right. Uh, if not, we've got the requested action to approve those sign locations on city properties uh, as requested. Is there a motion? So moved. All right. Uh, so council Second. member Strong moved. <laughs> council member Wilmes. Seconded. Uh, discussion on the mo motion. Councilmember Strawn is the maker of the motion. No, thank you. That answered my question. All right. Uh, Councilmember Wilmot says the seconder. No. Nope. Any other discussion? I think we just look forward to those, all those locations being operational and the feedback we get. All right. With that, we have the motion before us to approve those locations on city property. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously four to zero. That then brings us to our other business items this evening, uh, starting with item 7A, which is to receive the Ehlers uh, Utility Rate Study for Water, Sewer, and Storm Drainage Utility Funds, uh, and probably have a little bit of Q&A at that point. Uh, so I'll turn it over to our Finance Director, Michelle Petrick, to make introductions and initiate this uh, particular agenda item for us. Ms. Petrick. Good evening. Um, we have St Stacy Kilvang and Jean Vogt here with us tonight from Ehlers. Um, in 2020, we had hired Ellers to do a utility rate study on our water fund and storm drainage fund. And we requested that they do an update to see if the rates were working as we anticipated. And then we also requested that they do a utility rate study on our sanitary sewer fund. So they're going to walk through the rate updated rate study tonight and we're looking for feedback from the council and we will be bringing this back um, in November, the first meeting in November for further discussion along with the recycling rates at that time. Um, this has gone to the Finance Committee Commission. It will go to the Public Works Commission next week for review um, as part of the study, and Stacy will touch on this, we did find that the tiered rates were not set up in our, in our billing system correctly. We will be discussing alternatives with regard to that situation at next week's council meeting. So I'll turn it over to Stacy and Jean. Actually, if I could just uh, clarify one thing um, in relation to that. You said it had been before the Finance Commission? Yes. Uh, do we have any feedback from the Finance Commission yet at this point, or has that not been? Um, they endorsed uh, the rates as presented. Okay. All right. I hadn't, I don't know that I saw meeting minutes from that meeting yet in our packet, so. You'll so have them at the next meeting. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks for indulging that question. I'll enjoy uh, the presentation then from Alex. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Great to see you all, even though it's been a couple yeah, years. Yeah, you may have to kind of split the difference okay. between the two of you with the mic. There yeah. you go. Can you hear it a little bit better? I think that's all right. Better. So it's nice to see you. It's been a couple years since we've talked about utility rates. I think Council Member Strawn, you weren't on council last time we did this. So, you know, here we go with it all this time uh, that we'll walk you through everything. So basically we're just going to talk about the purpose of the study and the overview, and then we're going to get into the rate structure recommendation uh, that we have with regards uh, to your uh, various utilities that you have. So as um, uh, uh, Finance Director Petrick stated, you know, we did this for your water fund and your storm sewer fund back in 2020. So really what we do is we like to go back afterwards and say the rates of the recommendations that we had, are they working? Are they doing what you wanted them to do? And then are you covering your cost of your system? And that's what's important with regards to it. And then again, we looked at the sewer fund and really the most important thing there is to look at your base rate charges that you have and make sure it's paying for your fixed costs that you have of the system. Any system, be it your water system, your sewer system, there's just certain things that are always going to be there for costs that you want to make sure are paid for, which is, you know, you got to always be able to flush your toilet, right? Is your water running correctly? And you have st staff and operational costs that are there regardless if people are using that system or not that you've got to take care of. 
So we want to make sure that your funds, we're paying for all the capital needs um, that you have. You're an aging community, right, and your infrastructure aging. So we want to make sure you have adequate reserves um, to pay for any future improvements that are required. We want to make sure that your operations are covered and then any um, uh, debt service that you have for any of these uh, systems that you may have that you have to take on if you have to bond for them in the future. And really the big thing is is that we have to look at your reserves, right? Because things happen, right, with systems. Pipes burst, things happen, so you want to make sure you have enough reserves to pay for those until you collect adequate cash to re-back those up. So what we always recommend is that you have at least six months of um, operating and capital expenses, excluding uh, de or including depreciation of each of those systems. Your policy that you have or approved as a council is that at least 25% is operations reserve as a minimum for your policy. And then if you have debt for any of these systems, and again, you guys don't issue a lot of debt for these, and we have a minimal recommendation for that, we just want to make sure you have enough to cover your next service, year's debt service with regards to that. So we'll chart that out for you to see how you guys are complying or falling within those parameters. So when we look at the study, you know, there's three things that we always look at. One, obviously, we we're first looking, what's the impact to the residents or the businesses within your community? The second thing we look at is, what's the impact to the fund? How healthy is it? Or what capital can you actually get done? Or are there capital projects you have to put off because it may not make sense to increase rates to a certain level? And then finally, we look at what's the administrative or the impact of staff, right? So when you're going to take these systems and when you're going to uh, implement new rates and charges, how does it affect the building and everything that goes forward from there? So that's kind of the threefold that we look at it when we're doing these utility rate studies for you. So our findings, um, your cash balances um, are building. Uh, they're not all 100% what you need today, but we're getting there, right? And, and that's no different than any other community that we see out there. Um, everyone's always trying to build to keep reserves at an adequate level. Um, and sometimes when you have big projects that come up or oopses that happen with the system, you know, you'll draw down on those reserves and then you start to rebuild them over time. A majority of your capital projects, which we'll talk about, can be paid with cash. So that's pretty significant. You have very minimal bonding that you have to do uh, with your rate increases that you have. Uh, the sewer base and meter charge covers your fixed cost of the system, so that's great. That's one of the things that we wanted to make sure we went in and looked at that. And then your tiered rates, um, you know, they're doing, you know, what we thought that they would do, um, but part of going back through and double checking is where we found uh, the inconsistency with one of the rates that was inputted. And, you know, um, what we found is that really what it's only uh, impacted was a small portion of the residential and some of the commercial users. Um, apartments were fine and irrigation was all fine. So, again, uh, that happened, so it's a good thing why we go back and look to say, you know, what happened when we implemented the rates last time. So as you look at your capital projects over the next 10 years, it's pretty significant. You've got over 50 or 63 million uh, in capital expenses that you have. Uh, most of those are highlighted with the orange box. Those are actual physical structural things that you have to do for your system. So that's pipes and other facilities that you may have. That's 52 million. The rest is coming in the uh, portion of vehicles, obviously, that you have to buy, right, uh, for public works uh, to service all that and equipment that you need as well. And then some uh, building improvements as well that are required. But as we said, you get to pay cash. So your rates are adequate enough uh, to pay cash for the majority of it. Um, when you're looking at $63 million in projects and the fact that you may only need to bond for $4 million over the next 10 years, that's, that's pretty amazing uh, for your system that it's uh, well capitalized to be able to take care of that. Uh, we just have a shot in the arm in 2022 that we're recommending for your storm drainage fund uh, for projects that have to start to get underway. And then we're looking further out to 26 and 31 uh, for future bonding. So as we always say, right, in our life, it's like probably the next couple of years, we really kind of know what's going to happen, right? You know, so as we start to get out further in years five to ten, you know, things are going to change um, over time. But overall, we think we're, we're in good shape. So as we look at the water fund, the proposed water rates, it's a lot of small numbers on there, and so you guys did get these um, ahead of time. That essentially the meter increases, which a five eighths meter is the typical residential single family home meter. That's why we have that in there. That's going to go up just about three dollars a quarter, so twelve dollars a year. That's what folks are going to see for that increase on their bill. And then depending what tier you're in, you have four tiers. Um, your amount of water use per thousand gallons is going to go up anywhere at twenty seven cents to forty two cents. Um, for that thousand gallons, uh, depending again what tier that you are in. So the rate increases when we did this uh, back in 2020 um, are just a little bit slightly higher uh, that you have today, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, everybody knows, right? 
costs are going up, right, to take care of your system, right? Inflation's going up. So things are costing more to actually uh, service that system that you have. But the, the St. Paul Regional Water rates and what you're getting charged are higher. Okay, you don't have control over that. So that's what we're uh, forecasting in with regards to this. And then when we did this analysis, um, again, for the underbilling that happened uh, for the last probably 18 months of that last rate study that we had for residential and some of the commercial, we just made an assumption that some of it's going to be covered through rates. So you guys are going to have a policy discussion on how you want to proceed with that if you want to go back and recapture 100% or what portion you may look at. Doing that. So we went conservative, saying the system's going to pay for a portion of that. So when we look at the projections, uh, the dark orange uh, that you see in the background is your capital. That's, that's uh, three months capital for your operations. And the lighter orange is for your capital projects that you have. So that's your total of your six months that you have there. The blue bar is your actual working capital. So as you can see in 2022, you're really, really low. And why is that? Because <clears throat> you had a lot of projects and you're drawing down your cash. So over time, you're starting to build up. So we're seeing by 2026, you're getting to where you should be within that six month reserve for both of those three months uh, within each that we have. When we look at your sewer fund, uh, the takeaway there is again for residential, it's gonna be about 64 cents a quarter uh, that we have. And then the consumption charge is gonna go up five cents to seven cents depending on uh, where you are within the tiers that you have. And don't worry, at the end, as you guys know, we kind of show what does this mean to the, the, the low, median, and high users at the end of the day. When we look at your sewer fund projections, um, again, uh, your uh, 2022, oh, you're not doing too bad, right? You're a little bit better than you are in your water fund. And by 2024, we expect to build your uh, reserves back up uh, to where they actually need to be uh, for this fund. Uh, the interesting thing is that cash balances should be close to or exceed your target by 2024, which is great, a couple years out, and you have no bonding. Again, this fund is a little bit healthier uh, than your water fund. Uh, the storm drainage fund, uh, this is where we're going to have the biggest increase, but it's really not that bad when we look at it in the context of everything and where you are with your neighbors uh, that are out there. So for the storm drainage fund, um, there's going to be an increase of about five bucks a quarter. Uh, for every user out there to really get this fund up and adequate. So the big thing driving this is the capital needs that you have over the next 10 years. So your lift stations, things like that, that have been aging, we're probably at the critical point to start moving those up as far as the replacement with regards to that. So as we look at the storm drainage fund, um, again, you're not too bad in 2022. Uh, but that's because we're recommending that you bond for a million bucks to help start capitalizing to pay for some of those projects that you're going to have this year and coming into the next year. And I think as, uh, you know, Public Works went back and, and Engineering went back and looked at all the projects, they started to go every other year to push some things out to allow this fund to get a little bit healthy so you could start building cash so that we didn't have to bond in the future with regards to it. So this is the fund that needs uh, the most help over the next uh, 10 years with some possible bonding, but again, We'll watch the fund over time and see how uh, things actually turn out. So comparable communities. Um, yeah, it's nice to see what your neighbors are doing or who you consider to be comparable. But as we always say, that's not the best measure per se, because at the end of the day, you have assets that you have to take care of, right? That you have to take care of and maintain over time. And so it just costs what it costs to actually do that. But it is nice to say, oh, what are your neighbors charging and where do we fall within that? So what this chart is showing you, it's showing you two things. So all the lighter bars or colors in there are the 2022 rates for your comparable cities. And then the first darker bar and the orange circle on the left is where you compared to your peers in 2022. So you were about middle of the pack, okay? Now, um, most of these cities, we assume that they'll increase the rates for 2023. We don't have that data yet because not everyone's there. So we put you in on the, on the uh, orange circle on the right and the darker bars to say, where do your 2023 proposed rates as we have put into the study, how do you now compare to the other cities? So you're moving up closer, right, to the top end. But again, at the end of the day, those are based upon 2022 rates of your, your neighbors or comparables. So we assume that those will increase and probably at the end of the day, you might fall within the middle of that pack again. I think the interesting thing just to highlight here is the purple on the top of that bar. It kind of shows as a blue, you know, purplish blue in there. That's your storm sewer fund. And if you look again, how you compare with those other cities, even with the increase, you're probably um, about middle of the pack with regards to that. You're not at the high and you're not at the low, where you were at the lower probably before. So 
here it all comes together at the end of the day. So what you look at at the bottom, so take your eyes down to the bottom and you see the orange circle there. So this is on a quarterly basis. If you are a low uh, user for residential, uh, you're going to see about a $10 increase quarter, so $40 a year. If you're in a median, it's about $12 a quarter, right, or almost 100 bucks a year, and then you're going up to 13 at the high, so not overly significant. But the thing to note about this is that even if you're at the 10, the 12, or the 13, the biggest portion of that quarterly increase is the $5 for storm, okay? The rest is balanced between your water and sewer. And then as we look at the um, apartments, and then if we look at the commercial, uh, apartments are similar to residential at about the $11 a quarter. And then the low commercial is about $79, and then all up to the very, very high commercial. That's pretty significant. So those are businesses that's $11,000 a quarter. It's a lot of money. But those are your businesses that use water to make their products or their widgets or your car washes. That's, they're kind of in the water use business, and so they're used to paying those higher amounts that you have. And then your high irrigation uh, that we have in there as well is about $75 a quarter for those years. So at the end of the day, just going through, it, it's, it, we're solving for math, right? You know, you have needs of the system, um, so your rate increases are needed to pay for the cost of your system and the future capital that you have. It covers inflation and it helps you build reserves, which is important. At the end of the day, when you look at it, you're still competitive with your comparable cities that you have out there. And at the end of the day, you're going to be, you're in good shape. You're in good shape and your reserves, you're building just like you should be. And then things may happen, but then you'll continue building over time. So with that, we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you. Are there questions from the council on the uh, study results and the recommendations? Uh, Councilmember uh, McGrath. Just a clarification, would you remind us what the tiers are again? You've got four of them listed here. Yeah, yeah. so for residential, the first tier is zero to 15,000 gallons, and then 15,000 to 30 gallons. 30,000. 30, 30, 30, 30,000 gallons, yep. Okay, thank you. And any, then anything over 30,000 yeah. gallons. And then for commercial, it's zero to 60,000 gallons, and then um, 60 to 400,000, 400, yeah, 400,000 gallons. Right. And, and no, no proposed changes to the, the no, break points no, of the tiers? No. Okay. Everyone's still falling in line where they should. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, Councilman Wilmus? Uh, my question actually might relate a little bit more to planning within public works. Uh, so that, uh, I'll just I'll throw it out there and I don't necessarily even need an answer tonight, but something just to, to look at down the road. When we are looking at our capital projects, particularly uh, stormwater capital projects, we have a number of areas primarily of county roadway that do not have any type of stormwater infrastructure and from a planning perspective are we looking uh, that at that aspect of things um, is there potential to develop a number and look at some capital planning going forward for that. Right now, for example, there's large segments of Hamlin Avenue that simply rely on the old ditch system that we, mm -hmm. we have. And so when we have uh, rapid runoffs in the spring or heavy rains, um, we have a number of those lower lying areas that continue to flood, things like that. So when we look at the total dollar need and improvement improvements, I'm just wondering if some of those areas have been factored in. So. We can probably get a follow-up on that uh, at our discussion. Yeah. So unless, I don't need an answer. Engineering <laughs> wanted to answer it right now, but we don't have to. Any other questions for uh, staff or the consultants? I did want to clarify one thing that I thought I heard, but I wasn't sure. Uh, it, it, it seemed to be alluded to that uh, the proposed water rates, usage rates, attempt to take into account some sort of recovery of the underbilling, or was I mishearing that? If you could maybe just clarify that for me. No, it, it does include, um, we do assume a portion of the um, underbillings to be recouped, but not 100%. Okay, and we'll learn more about that at next week's discussion. Right. Right, okay, but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't mishearing that, that something is, is already factored in there for that recovery of underbilling mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, Graf. And then when I was reading through, it says uh, they're recommending a bond in 2026, mm -hmm. uh, and that is for to replenish the fund because of capital improvements. Is that what we're? Yes, 
Yep. So I think you mentioned what the three possible ones, like mm -hmm. painting the water tower and a couple other things. Yeah, specifically for 2026, we would be looking at um, some water main replacement, um, water tower repainting, and booster station rehab. Right. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for uh, the work you've done on this and, and for including the other funds besides the water fund this time around. We, we yes. appreciate that. And, uh, and especially the, uh, the confirmation that I think the path that we were on in terms of setting aside funds for our infrastructure and, and uh, operating uh, reserve needs have, have you know, put us in a good place except for a few corrections that we need to do, and that's, that's what we like to know. So um, <laughs> appreciate that again and look forward to our discussion next week. And I don't know, Ms. Petrick, if you have any final words or things you need from us this evening. Um, not really. Okay. Um, you, you look poised to say something, <laughs> so if I'm incorrect in that interpretation, please no. correct me. Um, I would just clarify that with, we discussed the storm drainage um, when I brought the preliminary CIP forward, um, and that's really more a result of we've identified the full system and its age and the need to start considering replacing. Um, throughout this process, public works and finance have been working together. Um, public works did move a number of projects. They reprioritized, so the CIP has changed um, as we've gone through this. Um, and we're actually continuing to work on the CIP. So. Um, like they, Ellers has noted, bonding in 2026, as we refine and reprioritize projects, we may not even need to do that bonding. So I just wanted to you to be aware of that. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. And we look forward, as I said, to our discussion next week then in terms of the uh, water utility specifically. Yep. Great. Right. Sounds good. Thanks again. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and I'm presuming that there aren't members of the public who wish to speak to that item this evening. We'll certainly have it back before us under utility rates and the like. With that, then we'll move to our next item on tonight's work session discussion, which is the uh, discussion of a draft tenant notification ordinance. And we have Janice Gunlock, our community development director, with us this evening uh, for this item. Ms. Gunlock. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, I don't have a lengthy PowerPoint presentation for you because this is the third time this ordinance has been in front of you. The last time was in May. At that time, we had sought direction from the council on a process to engage with the public before commencing sort of a formal ordinance consideration process. Um, as a reminder, the proposed tenant notification ordinance's intent is to provide greater housing stability, protection, and notification to tenants of rental property during an ownership transition specifically. Um, the proposed ordinance does three things. The first one is I want to make sure we're all understanding that it only applies to licensed rental properties. And what that means is rental properties containing five or more units and obtain a license from the fire department. Um, secondly, it does impose a 90-day advance notice to the city when an affordable project is going to be placed up for sale. And the ordinance defines what's as a, what affordable is, which is a certain percentage of units within that licensed building uh, being offered rents at 80% AMI or less. And then the third thing is it does impose the 90-day tenant notification period, whereby new ownership can't make substantial changes to lease agreements um, during that time frame, which includes raising rent, rescreening applicants or tenants, and then making any other material change to the lease, which is also defined in the proposed ordinance. Since May, staff did execute and or we drafted and executed a public engagement plan. Both of those documents are included in your packet. We attempted to summarize the results of that. Um, we did inform every rental unit in the city that is covered under our licensing program of the ordinance. And then through the various engagement efforts, we had about 104 meaningful engagement occurrences where we actually spoke face to face with individuals who occupied rental property. Um, the overwhelming response from renters was just appreciation of the ordinance, recognizing that it would be beneficial if they ever found themselves in a situation where their property was being sold and they may have to move, being offered more opportunity to figure out what to do. 
In terms of the non-renter stakeholder feedback, there were two main themes, and I'm sure you can uh, anticipate what those were. From the owner-manager group of stakeholders, they, bas they basically said they um, didn't like the pre-sale notification requirements. So this isn't the tenant notification piece. This is the piece in the ordinance where if you own an affordable building, you have to notify the city 90 days before putting it up for sale. Um, there really was dissatisfaction with that requirement. I want to emphasize the purpose of that requirement is to give the city opportunity to intervene to maintain affordability because once a purchase agreement is already signed or the property has changed hands, there's really not an ability to do that. From the um, housing advocate stakeholder group, there was a belief that the tenant notification ordinance doesn't go far enough in terms of enacting protections for renters. And um, I do believe I included an email that we got from Homeline that outlined a couple of things. And I'm happy to go through those if you're interested. Some of the other minor feedback that we received was there, um, the Minnesota Multifamily Housing Association want us to include a definition of rent specifically to uh, state that utilities or extra charges um, included with the rent are excluded from the um, relocation assistance if and when that gets implemented. So we did include that definition already in the ordinance that we included in your packet. And then there was also a conversation regarding the exemption for construction activity during the tenant notification period specific to lead and asbestos. And so we worked with the Housing Justice Center to tweak that language to note that those types of construction activities would be allowed to occur during the tenant notification period as long as the contractors were following best management practices for remediation of lead <laughs> and asbestos, they had the proper certifications and were operating under an approved building permit. Um, staff is seeking direction from the council tonight on whether or not you want to keep that notice to the city of a proposed sale provision, um, whether or not you believe any additional revisions to the ordinance are necessary, and if and when you'd like to bring this back for formal ordinance consideration or uh, adoption if you're interested. We're not looking for that tonight. Um, we have posted the draft ordinance on our proposed ordinances webpage. So the earliest we could consider formal adoption would be October 24th, so next Monday. That's all I have, and I can attempt to address any questions from you. All right, thank you, Ms. <coughs> Dunlock. And so just to clarify for maybe members of the public who may not be as up to speed on this as we are, uh, essentially what this is, it's an opportunity for both the city as well as tenants to have advanced notification of a pending uh, uh, sale or transfer, essentially, of a multifamily building. Uh, that contains affordable units as has been defined. Uh, the city notice benefits the city in terms of the ability to potentially look to preserve if that is in fact naturally occurring affordable housing or that sort of thing, um, that status, if you will, of that property. Uh, I think in the you know, ordinance it does exempt sort of buildings or, or complexes that are required to maintain affordability by a definition for an extended period of time contractually through either financing tools or whatever is in place that requires that affordability. We're really only talking, as I understand it, about buildings where the affordability is very potentially transient uh, and could depend on change in ownership, as I understand it. Is that correct, uh, Ms. Gunlock? Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, and so the notice is to the city to potentially, if the city is able to or has the desire to um, uh, preserve that affordability in some manner if we're able to. Uh, and then the notice to the tenant provides the tenant more time to be able to adjust their living circumstances or react to changes to, to leases or that sort of thing. Uh, and then we also have the relocation uh, expenses provision if uh, during the notification period uh, the owner or landlord makes substantial changes to the terms of the lease or that sort of thing, rent increase, that sort of thing. Um, and then also, um, uh, I believe those are the, the kind of the key provisions. Um, question, I'll turn it over to the council for any questions the council may have uh, for staff before I get in. I've got a, a couple of them I want to follow up on it as well. But uh, council, any questions for staff on the proposed ordinance? I would just add in um, the, another change would be if they tried to re-check uh, everyone's ability to be a renter. Full credit? Right. Yeah, credit. But not only yeah. credit, but background. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's all part of it as well. Right. No, very good point. Good point. 
Uh, if there aren't other council questions, I will uh, maybe, oh, Councilman Um I'm wondering in the purpose statement if we should be more clear about what this does or doesn't apply to, and I was thinking of the language related to five or more units. Mm -hmm. um, I know we spell it out in our definitions and I think elsewhere, but I'm just wondering if that's something that makes sense just to have in the purpose statement. What are we targeting, if you will? What type of properties? It may be worthwhile to do and, and potentially even in the title of the ordinance it might mm -hmm. be possible to, to add something in there parenthetically. Other we can, questions? We can no. certainly add that for your next consideration. Sure. Uh, it, Councilman Woods? It, as far as notice of to the city of proposed sale, what what would the city, I, I understand looking to try and retain affordability, things like that, what are some of the mechanisms that we have in place to employ to, to do that, if you will? What are we going to act upon, if you will, and how? The single biggest tool that the city has in order to preserve affordable housing is affordable housing tax increment financing. Okay. We have some other funds through the HRA that could be used uh, separately from affordable housing TIF, but affordable housing TIF is the single biggest tool that is available to us. Okay. Thank you. And maybe just to follow up on that, so as an example, if we're notified of a pending sale and the city pursues affordable housing tax increment financing, uh, yeah, are all we talking about doing is establishing the tax increment district or or do we have to have sort of a partner to use the funds at the same time as that? Because I know we've established a district in southeast Roseville, but we don't actually have a project yet. And I wondered about, you know, how that would apply to this type of situation. We have an ownership change notification, uh, but perhaps haven't developed a project, so to speak. Yeah, there's some good details there, Council. Um, there wouldn't some owners may choose to just ride out the 90 days and then put it up for sale. They're uninterested in encumbering their property with any additional restrictions. Um, the city probably isn't interested in entering into any agreements with an owner who's going to sell it. It's more to put the um, broker or person interested in marketing the property for sale for the current owner that the new owner, if they're interested, the city is willing to have conversations about what that might be. Um, we may engage in those conversations and they still may say we are uninterested and then you just wait the 90 days out. Um, that also gives the people, the tenants in that apartment building to understand that the city is, is talking with the new owners or at least the people representing the sellers that this is a possibility but it may not happen. That gives them some additional time to determine if they're going to be able to stay or go even before the 90-day tenant notification period comes into play. So we need a partner. And that example in Southeast Roseville is a really good example. We were proactive in creating that tax increment mm -hmm. financing district because we knew that property was going up for sale. We could not get the new buyer to take any assistance to help improve those units. So we will be coming back before you to decertify that district because you have to actually have a project and enter yeah. into a development agreement for that district to actually work. So that's a good example. Now, had we had this ordinance in place, would have it made a difference on that property? Probably not, but not having it really doesn't give us any opportunity to preserve naturally occurring affordable housing. Right, no, thank you for going into more detail on that. Um, I wondered uh, in a couple of areas, um, on the definition of affordable at 80% of AMI, uh, could you talk about how that was arrived at? I know some of, some other cities have used different percent of AMI area median income as their definition of affordability, and, and ours is, as I said, 80%. So if you could just maybe talk a little bit about how that was arrived at. Yeah, that's also a good detail. There are a lot of communities who have this ordinance where the affordability threshold is at 60% AMI, which means the rents are lower than um, our proposed ordinance, which is using 80% AMI. We just felt that um, the opportunity to give tenants more time and the um, once the relocation assistance comes into play, having the affordability threshold a little bit higher offers a little bit more protections to tenants because a lot of times these tenants are on month-to-month -month leases and they may get a notification that they have to leave within 30 days 
And so even if they're paying 80% AMI or even market rate, it can really create some barriers to finding new housing. So we just felt that using the 80% AMI was a more restrictive standard to provide greater protection for the tenants of our rental housing. If you would like to use 60, we can certainly do that. Um, and the Housing Justice Center provided this template ordinance. Um, the 80% is in their current template ordinance, but many communities alter some of these details to fit their individual needs. So that's the type of feedback we're looking for from you before we move forward. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, a couple of other things. One is um, in terms of, I noticed uh, the, the, the representative that, that mentioned that the uh, issues that seemed to be the most acute was sort of the ability for tenants to um, um, have notice, advance notice of eviction, um, and that's not something that's a part of this, uh, and not something that the EDA has even, or the city council has actually taken up up to this point. And so um, I just wanted to note that that was one of the things they felt was more urgent. It, it does seem uh, in our case that we've got a lot of older buildings that are naturally occurring affordable and there is always the potential for a sale and so I it, you know from my perspective it does make sense to have something like this on the books to at least give uh, give us an opportunity to look at preserving it and certainly that additional notification for the tenants uh, the final thing was I guess that didn't turn into a question but um, the final thing was I, we had some conversations offline with Gunlock about the potential for uh, or maybe it was even in some of the materials that provided to the whole council that the city could collect some of the information that's being requested as part of this ordinance as part of the licensing process each year that the, the um, owners or landlords are, are already undertaking to maintain their licenses. Uh, certainly that does sort of streamline and simplify the process. I would think at that point it also gives the city the ability to at least based on that data, transient as it may be, or transitory that it may be, that um, that we can make a designation of a property as affordable by this definition so that we already know ahead of time if we get the notice of a sale that they qualify or if we, ha you know, that they know, that the owner knows is what I really meant to say is that they already know that they have that status and so they would know that they qualify to provide that notice to the city under this ordinance. Is that something that makes sense from a process point of view and something we can look at maybe adjusting in terms of the language of the ordinance and any of our other ordinances that may require that? Um. Or maybe it doesn't require adjustment of any of the language, it just is what what bucket the information sort of falls into in the process behind the scenes. So if I, I think I'm sort of following the line of questioning and the concern is um, some of the owners and managers had talked about getting rid of that notice to the city of a proposed sale. They don't like having to wait 90 days before actually putting a property up for sale. And that requirement only applies to affordable housing as defined in the ordinance, which is rents offered to people at or below 80% AMI. A lot of the owners and managers were like, what does that mean? Because the owners and managers' ideas of affordability are probably different and not the same as what a tenant who's living in those buildings deems as affordable. And so trying to figure out what that means before determining whether or not the ordinance even applies to you, then having to wait the 90 days just seemed overly burdensome to the owner and manager group. So what we talked about is with the, um, and, and to be clear, the ordinance right now, that pre-sale notice only, requires to, only applies to affordable projects. You could make that apply to every project. Um, I, I'm not sure that the purpose for having that in place is as needed if it applies to every project versus trying to preserve affordability for affordable projects. But what we talked about as a solution was when owners and managers fill out their annual license application, we, we would add a question to the license application that asks them to disclose to us what their rent range, ranges are and how many units they have in that. that and we would frame that question up based on what the HUD limitations are for affordability at or below 80% AMI. And then that way, the ownership group isn't put in a situation where they need to provide us really detailed information about rents, which we don't want, we don't need it, but the question on the application puts us on notice about 
is this an affordable project or isn't this an affordable project? So we can much more easily answer the question of whether or not that pre-seal notice requ requirement applies. And I also just want to touch on a comment you made earlier, Mayor, is most of our rental housing projects in the city probably are at that 80% AMI level or less because, if you'll recall, we do have one market rate project that just went up a couple of years ago, and that's the first one we've had in 35 plus years. So everything else in the city is probably the mid to late 60s, which fits into that nationally occurring affordable housing category. So we're kind of talking semantics, but not really, if you leave it in. Right, no, and I appreciate that. And the only thing I would clarify is when you, when you mentioned or talked about projects, you were referring to buildings or facilities because we're not talking about something being built as part of what we're talking about here. It's it's existing facilities. That's right, correct. yeah. So just for clarity's sake. Um, did that discussion raise any other questions for members <coughs> of the council or follow-up uh, that is needed? Councilor Strong. So just to confirm, we are talking about um, only five or five units or greater, correct? All right. I know we mentioned adding that. I'm sure that was part of what our discussion was. Right. Right. All right. Then, uh, and I'll ask if there is anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this this evening. Uh, otherwise, uh, this will be uh, back before us potentially at a, at a future date, as, and that's part of our discussion this evening. Uh, council, uh, are we sort of okay where we're at right now? Do we want to make any changes uh, uh, other than the clarification of the five units in the title and purpose? Um, any else, anything else that we want to look at adjusting in the ordinance uh, or uh, are we prepared to bring it back for council consideration? And is the 24th appropriate? I know we've got a very busy agenda that evening or is that something that we want to perhaps push out a little bit? It just has to... been posted, correct? I believe it is. Yep, it's been posted, so we could. whatever date you wish, we can make it work. All right. Thoughts from the council? Yes, no on bringing it back and timing? I think we can bring it back and I think the timing's okay. We've had this on the docket for a while and it's not like it's a new subject. Sure. No, I'm just trying to manage our, our yeah. 24th uh, meeting so that it doesn't go into the, I was going to say into the dark of night, but I guess it's too late for that. But <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's the dark of night. Right, exactly. Time of year. Exactly. All right. And as we're setting up the agenda, if it does look like it's going to be an issue, I, we can maybe have staff communicate with the council about, hey, we might have to move something here. Sure. Okay? okay? Great. Thank you, Ms. Gunlock. Thank Thanks uh, to staff for all the engagement and outreach that was done on this, uh, as well as all the work to put this together uh, and, and putting up with our questions this evening and, and prior to this evening. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. That brings us then to item... Uh, 7C, which is to set a date uh, to canvas the general election. I'll turn it over to C Manager Trudgeon for that item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you know, we have an upcoming election on November 8th. Uh, we do need to uh, officially certify and canvas the results of that election. Ramsey County has been in communication with us. They will need the full week after that election um, to compile the results and make sure everything's proper. And under state law, we have a longer time to certify. So we are looking to schedule a special council meeting the week of November 14th. That's the Monday uh, through the rest of the week. We do need to have it certified by the end of the week on the 18th. Um, it would just be a special meeting to take a few minutes uh, to do that. I did send out communication to the council before just to make them aware of that. I think a couple council members uh, will be unable to attend. Um, and uh, the options were either around noon hour at, or at 5 or 6, 5, 5.30 at night. And looking at some of the compilations, it looks like maybe Wednesday, either at 12.30 or 5 o'clock would work the best, but we have other options. So I just will throw that out there uh, if there are alternatives to consider. All right, uh, Councilman. Strong? I just wanted to mention my availability has changed since my indication, so. Okay. Change to, to include more <laughs> possibilities? I was not going to be in the state. Got it. So okay. I am now going okay. to be in the state. That makes it a lot easier. Okay. Uh, Councilman Wilmes? Uh, I, I did not get back to you, so apologies. Um, earlier in that week, around the noon hour would be better for me. Monday or so, Tuesday could also possibly so work at 1230. Councilman McGrath? I will not be able to attend. Oh, that you're one of the, the, one. the, one of the so unavailable. So Wednesday okay. at noon? Uh, 1230 uh, for Councilman Bratton. Mm -hmm. He cannot make it at noon. Mm -hmm. He can make okay. it at 1230. So Wednesday at 1230? Yep, Wednesday, good. That works. Wednesday, all right, let's do Wednesday at 1230 then. So is the county hedging, or they say we're, we're not gonna have results for three days, or where are they at? I, I don't know about that. 
I do. I know traditionally we get uh, results pretty late at night. Yes, and you can count on that. This, for this sure. is the compilation of yes. the detailed yeah, report right. on the right. results. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, can we have a motion to set that meeting for canvassing the election for 12:30 p.m. on Wednesday, November 16th? So moved. Uh, moved by Councilmember. It's uh, Wednesday, correct? Correct. All right. Moved by Councilmember Wilmus, seconded by Councilmember Strawn to set at 12.30 p.m. on Wednesday, the 16th of November to canvas the general election. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously, four to zero, and that date is set. Uh, thank you again for that, and thanks to staff for doing the research. Uh, next, we have a consideration of our consent agenda down to two items, A and B. Uh, Mr. Trudgeon, would you introduce the consent items to us this evening? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 10A approves a temporary gambling permit for Ro Rosetown American Legion Auxiliary for raffles to be held on November 23rd and December 14th. And then finally, agenda item 10B authorizes the purchase of batteries for the Zamboni at the Roseville Skating Center. Very expensive batteries, but uh, um, we need to have them be ready for the season. All right. Thank you, Mr. Trudgeon. Are there questions? Excuse me. Is there a motion on the consent items A and B? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Strawn, second by Councilmember Wilmus. Any discussion on the motion to approve those items? No. Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Those items are approved. That then brings us to future agenda review, communications, reports, announcements. Mr. Trudgeon on the future agenda. Yes, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we do have a busy meeting uh, next Monday, the 24th. We have Native American Heritage Month proclamation. We will consider an ordinance regarding the possession of catalytic converters based on the Bloomington ordinance. We did discuss that at the last meeting, and the uh, council was interested in taking it up. We do want to discuss the THC regulations. We have communicated with the stakeholders uh, that we want to have a conversation about potential framework for regulations. We don't. Uh, we've been working on an ordinance, but we don't have a specific ordinance for you to consider uh, that evening. It's more of a discussion. We uh, receive an update on the water bill underbilling. Uh, then on the consent agenda, we'll have the conditional use for the drive-through uh, for Starbucks. We will also add uh, the tenant notification ordinance uh, as well for that evening. On the 7th, uh, we will have an EDA meeting, a uh, quarterly EDA meeting. We have a couple business items for subordination. Uh, for the development agreement and loan documents for the harbor development. We'll look to approve some contracts with CEE, Golden Shovel, and MCCD. Look to approve the meeting calendar for 23 and get a review of the Choose Roseville campaign. Oh, Councilman Um I might suggest setting the 2023 calendars after the general election. You're going to have a different council. We can do it all the way up to December 5th. So, just a suggestion. Okay. So. Well, we could certainly take it up at that EDA meeting on the 7th and then, you know, finally approve it later than that. Yeah, the EDA meeting, uh, or the EDA calendar is obviously just for the EDA. We are looking to have uh, a, a city council conversation as well on the 7th, mm -hmm. but we can move that uh, anywhere to the end of the year if we'd like. So if I'm remembering correctly, after the 28th, we only have one other meeting currently December scheduled 5th, for the yeah. council. We yeah. don't have any more EDA meetings, although we can obviously... No, we should probably do the EDA uh, calendar. That's something. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let's, let's leave them on the agendas for the, those meetings then for now. Okay. And then if we need to make adjustments after the election, we can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. And obviously that those adjustments can be made at any time by... Right, any, right, right. For any yeah. reason. All right. Okay. Uh, and then at the regular council meeting, we'll uh, review the 2023 utility rates, which you have a sneak preview on, but it's an opportunity to ans answer or ask any uh, more questions you may have. Look at the uh, fee schedule for the first time. Uh, we do want to bring back some changes to the Chapter 309 massage therapy. This is an ongoing um, work that we were doing to make sure that we have um, uh, proper regulations in place in the ordinance, as well as uh, criteria for applying. Uh, look at the City Council EDA calendar, um, then on the consent agenda appoint um, uh, youth commissioners uh, as they come up. Uh, November 28th, we would hold the public hearing for the 2023 budget and tax levy, uh, hold a public hearing for the 2023 liquor license renewals. We want to have a discussion about no mo may, or maybe mo less may. Um, this is just a discussion at this point. We want to get way ahead of it so we're not here uh, in May mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. it again. Uh, we look to award the city uh, attorney contract for the upcoming years. 
There is a minor plan at 2867 Dale Street that the City Council will need to consider and then begin the discussion on legislative priorities for the next session. So there's a lot coming up. Great. Any uh, questions, uh, or further questions for staff on the uh, upcoming meeting agendas? Are there any announcements, communications, or requested uh, council member initiated items for future meetings? All right. Uh, the only other item we have on our agenda this evening is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Groff, seconded by Councilmember Wilmus to adjourn. No discussion on a motion to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>